So like, as always, please subscribe to our YouTube channel. There's a bunch of links in the description. One of them is about the events we have. We have a bunch of interesting events. Check them out. And also there is a link pinned in the live chat. This is the link you can use for asking questions. So during the interview, we'll talk about different things. And then if you feel like asking something, it's better not to use the live chat because it's very hard to keep track of questions there. Just use the pinned link. And now I will open the document we prepared for you. And if you're ready, we can start. Yes, I'm ready. This week we'll talk about making machine learning interpretable. And we have a very special guest today, Christoph. Christoph has a PhD in interpretable machine learning from the Ludwig Maximilian University of Munich. And he worked for a while in both academia and industry, and now he is a full-time tech writer. He has written many technical books. And if you're watching this in video, there is a bookshelf behind Christoph. Yeah. With all these four books at the top, yeah. which we will probably talk about some of them today. And yeah, it's a great pleasure to have you, uh, Christoph. Welcome to the show. Yeah. Thank you for the invitation. Yeah. So the questions for today, as always, are prepared by Johanna, Johanna Bayer. Thanks, Johanna, for your help. And before we start with our main topic, let's talk about your background. Can you tell us about your career journey so far? Yeah. Um, so my background is kind of different phases. Phase one was classic statistician education, I would say, like bachelor in statistics, master in statistics. Um, so very classic, but uh, like hypothesis testing and stuff like this. And in the end, I was already a bit drawn to machine learning, did like Kaggle competitions and stuff. Um, and right after I finished my master, I uh, went to industry. So one year in fintech startup where I worked as a data scientist, two years as more classic statistician where I worked in medical research. And during that time, I already started uh, writing the book, uh, Interpretable Machine Learning because I had like a part-time position. So uh, next, I, I just like had different side projects and one of them was the book. It's a bit ironic because after my master's thesis, uh, I really hated my master's thesis, like the writing process. So it's quite ironic that I picked up writing again then. Um, and as I was it's like- Different kind of writing, right? It's very different, yeah. Um, I think that was a reason why it worked for me. Um, so, when I was writing the book, I was like, it kind of took the fear out of writing for me again, because um, the main reason I also didn't do a PhD was like, oh, I have to write papers. I hate writing. I hated my master thesis, so I should not do a PhD. But when I started the book, you, I realized I could. You had it. a fear of writing, yet you thought, okay, let's write a book. Let's see how it goes. Yeah, yeah because I don't know. For the master thesis, I was very stressed out. Uh, if it's it was not only about writing. I wasn't. Maybe it wasn't fear of writing, but I hated the process. Experiments, all that, right? And then getting feedback from your. At least this is, was this is how it was for me. Like I didn't doing all these experiments, yeah. showing it to my supervisor, and then he would say, mm, "Something doesn't seem right. Maybe you need another <laughs> half a year." Right? Yeah. Yeah, and also didn't feel so free like writing the master's thesis. But when I started the book, I wrote it in the open, uh, got feedback, and uh, I just could like write how I felt. So like put in some jokes and not be like, not hide behind math or anything. Just say like, oh, okay, this is like this. Use like analogies and stuff like this. So I enjoyed this part very much, um, which then led me to do a PhD. Uh, so back to academia. Then I, mm. I again learned to hate uh, writing. <laughs> so I really hated uh, writing papers, um, but still like I finished my PhD. Uh, this was one year ago. Then I actually tried like a postdoc job for a few months and another job in industry for a few months. And I, I it didn't feel right, kind of. I quit both very quickly. And then I thought back, like, okay, what, what's left? Uh, what can I do? Because I, like, all these things are now, uh, I quit all these things. And so I looked back and the only constant thing was writing for me, which I always enjoyed. Um, and then I decided, yeah, why not do this full time? 
I already had my first book, so I had a little bit of income uh, from that book and uh, already some established uh, like a reader base um, and some experience. And so I jumped into this uh, um, and I'm doing this now for a year and a uh, half now. And yeah, works out so far. Yeah, well, I know that Munich is not the cheapest city. So apparently it's uh, working out pretty well for you, right? Well, I'm earning less than I did at my PhD. Uh -huh. I, okay. Usually people like uh, climb up in their career, like in the um, how much they earn. And for me, it was like each each career step was a little less money, <laughs> <laughs> which is a bit funny, but I have like so much freedom that I don't uh, regret it. Um, but when I started, I like my first job was in Switzerland. So, and my second job was part-time job. So I was like a little bit less than back to Munich, a little bit less. <laughs> And now okay. um, with my writing, again, a little bit less than a PhD. Mm -hmm. um, but I think PhD, full-time PhD is not, I mean, it could earn more, of course, now if I would go for regular data scientist role. Um, but I enjoy the freedom a lot um, that I have now as a writer. So you can just go to one of the lakes in the Alps. <laughs> in the laptop. Yeah. That's writing. Well, now maybe it's a bit cold for now for that now right but still you can do this right if you wanted yeah and i can do like sports in the middle of the day or start mm -hmm. cooking early i love uh, cooking for example mm -hmm. and but still think sometimes i'm about writing and it's, so make progress there at the same time so yeah do you remember what was your first kaggle competition oh the first one this was during my masters and i, I didn't yet um, know much machine learning. So my first models was like a linear regression model and generalized additive model. Uh, I think it was something with diabetes. Not, not sure entirely what the topic was, um, but I remember that I was really, really bad at the competition. <laughs> and this was for me also like this, uh, because in theory, I, I mean, I, I knew how to model data, how to build a prediction model. Um, but just like from statistician, statistician point of view, not from a machine learning point of view. So my first thoughts were like, okay, this should be like a generalized additive model with these and these features. I didn't even like have a validation set up on my side and and haven't like fully understood or not what you do in statistics, right? Yeah. yeah. Okay, I remember my first Kaggle competition was like I did super bad because like I thought mm -hmm. like with all this knowledge I have from my courses, like I would just ace it. And then the reality was the complete opposite. Yeah. Yeah, it was uh, quite interesting. And like, how did you become interested in interpretable machine learning? Is it something you were doing during your master's or is it something you needed to do at your work in your mm -hmm. in that in tech startup or? What um, I think this? for me, it was quite natural, I think, because as a statistician, you always you think about the data generating process and when you build model they are usually interpretable and so this is the the mindset that came from this okay let's understand the data let's build an understandable model and when i transitioned more into machine learning i this this was kind of lost not fully because there were things like the random forest which, which had this in, built in feature importance and stuff like this but it felt like okay there's parts missing and then during my this, uh, second job in, in Switzerland, I had these side projects and, and one of and, and this one day off, I, I read the line paper, which is about this interpretability method that fits like um, linear models to explain individual predictions of more complex models. And this was quite fascinating to me, like, oh, well, we could have a really complex model and then still use um, or still have a chance to understand what's going on inside the model. And then I wanted to learn more, but I couldn't learn more because there was not so much material online. And that was my motivation to write a book about this topic. I was quite lucky with the timing as well because there, there was not, nothing mm -hmm. on, on the market yet. So like speaking of Kaggle, like in Kaggle, you don't really care about the explainability, interpretability, all you care about is predictions, right? You care about yeah. all these predictions and like, it doesn't matter how exactly the model is making these predictions. Yeah. And uh, like sometimes it works, that work is also like you have a similar situation, right? So like churn on churn, maybe like if it's a lot of users, you don't really go and dig 
deeper into each individual user when you want to understand like why this particular decision happened like as long as the business metrics are satisfied like everyone is happy like then you just you know stack more layers or i don't know do something right so you don't necessarily go and try to figure out like for this particular customer why my model was wrong i imagine there are many many cases especially in medical research where you have to care about that yeah so I, not, I, I think I don't fully uh, agree with Ke the Kaggle case, um, mm -hmm. because in Kaggle, of course, you, the, what gets you the money is um, to be right with the, your predictions. I think interpretability can help you even with Kaggle to debug mm -hmm. a little, and to this really stupid example, but I'm doing a competition at the moment, and I when I created the features, I kind of had a target leakage because I uh, uh, like a version of my target I put into my features. Um, and I, but I also had like uh, interpretability at the end of the model, like to look at the feature importances using uh, um, Shop. And immediately, so uh, first of all, I saw like, oh, the predictions go, the prediction errors going down by a lot. I was like super happy. But then, like, a little voice in my head said, this, this is not true. Mm -hmm. Don't be happy. There's something wrong with your model. And it turned out to be wrong. And I super quickly found the bug because I, um, for the feature importance ranking, this one feature bubbled to the top. Now, you wouldn't need uh, feature importance for this, of course, because you could check your column names, for example. But if you have like a large feature uh, set, then it's quite tedious to look through all of them. And um, for these interpretation methods, if you have such a mistake, they like target leakage, it bubbles just to top like the, the most important feature. And so I, I would say interpretability is Even useful for Kaggle. debugging your model. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So you still take part in competitions? It's been some time, yeah. Um, it's my first competition in many years. Uh -huh. um, okay. It's not on Kaggle. It's on, what is it called? Data-driven, I think. Uh -huh. It's for forecasting um, water, um, water volume through rivers. Uh -huh. Yeah, speaking yeah. of flexibility, right? So with yeah. this kind of... Uh... I don't know if I can say a job, but with this sort of activity, you have the freedom of doing other things like yeah. taking part in competitions. Okay, so you realized that this is an important topic. There, are, there is not so much, there was not so much literature, information available about that. And you thought, hmm, I don't like writing, but maybe I should try doing it one more time, right? Kind of, yeah. So I, I just started to, I, I don't know my thought process. I was just like, well, this would be a cool opportunity. And at this point, my master thesis was, I think, two two years behind me. Maybe I just forgot how it felt. <laughs> um, But also, it was kind of stress-free because I could just write. It was a side project for me, so no stakes involved at, at this point. So I had no pressure like, okay, you have to, to do the writing so well that you get your master's degree or or to get a paper published or anything. I was just I could just write how how I felt it to be like the best way. And so this brought kind of the fun back to me for like writing stuff because I really enjoy like understanding difficult things and writing them down in a simpler way. And um this is some, yeah writing is one way how you can express this. Mm -hmm. So the best way is to learn something is to teach something or at least write about this. Right? Yeah, it's a bit like this. Um, it's also a problem because um, sometimes when I write my newsletter or when I pick a new book, when I already know the topic, I feel like there's not so much value in it, which is obviously wrong because at some point I didn't know these things. And I would love to, would, like at this point in the past, I would have loved to read about them. But for me, it feels like, if it's too easy to write about, it's not worth writing about it. It's it's obviously wrong because it's if someone else, if enough other people have value from from your writing, then your writing is valuable. Um, so I kind of mix Actually, this it's up. It's like um, easy an easy text because like yeah. when it comes to machine learning, it's a complex thing, and if there is some resource that explain explains complex things with simple language, then it's good, right? Yeah, it's good. Um, yeah, but for, sometimes um, I feel like 
I already understand this. I shouldn't write about it. But sometimes <laughs> that's maybe the most valuable thing to write about because I already have understood it and maybe it was hard for me to, to understand it. But if I want to write about something new, I always feel like I also have to learn it right now. But also the, one of the reasons why I became a writer was so I can always learn new things. Uh, so it's it's kind of like a dance between these two things. Like it should be like simple so I can don't, don't spend too much time on one thing, mm -hmm. but also I want to write about something that's exciting for me as well. Why a book? Because like usually the story I hear from authors and I, I also published uh, and for me it was like first I wrote an article, then like a bunch of articles. And then I thought, okay, like maybe I do something larger. Mm -hmm. But you just jumped yeah, that's true. into a book while yeah. not really liking writing. Yeah, good question. Um, for me, I already did some blogging before. But I always quit after a few months. Uh, so, but I already had a little bit of experience with writing more freely, and with the book, it was some. It wasn't like hide in my room for two years and then finish the book and, and publish it. But I published uh, it as like a website. It's still uh, interpretable. Machine learning is still available for free, and I published it like chapter by chapter. So it kind of felt like blogging. Uh, but of course, it was it's like a one unit. Um, but but this allowed me to to get feedback very early on, and to write this chapter by chapter. So it didn't feel like one huge chunk, like like a huge mountain to to climb, um, but little steps. So and I think if I didn't had hadn't gotten any feedback in the beginning, so I shared it on Twitter, for example. I'm not sure if I would have finished the book. Or if it would have just been like half a book or so, or a much shorter mm -hmm. book. But also, as we spoke at the beginning briefly, you didn't, you don't have a publisher. You publish on your own, right? Yes, and I then do. this requires a lot of self-discipline. So, yeah. like, if you don't publish a chapter, in a case, in a case with a publisher, publisher will chase you, like, hey, mm -hmm. where's another chapter? Like, yeah, it's like the due date was like half a year ago. Uh, like, do something. Yeah. But here you have to be chasing, like if you're late, you have to like chase yourself. So you have to have discipline yeah. for that. So how, how do you do that? Like, uh, is there a secret or you're you just so like the topic and you so liked writing? Some, so I'm, I would say I'm inherently motivated to do the writing, but sometimes to force myself to like bring everything together because um, I sometimes use deadlines for myself to, yeah, because sometimes it's, you feel like, okay, you could write more or maybe add another chapter, um, but sometimes you just have to finish and a deadline is then important. But I, I, I actually was approached by publishers, uh, like typical technical publishers, and they asked me, for example, hey, do you want to uh, publish interpretive machine learning with us? Um, or maybe also write a new book on topic X, Y, Z. Um, and I always like research them, like how did they work? And then I read about it and I was like, no, that's not my style. I don't want to uh, like have like their strict schedule. And then I heard about like, oh, sometimes the editors they have, they are not so good. And then I don't get all the royal, like, like a much smaller share of the royalties. And I was like, no, I'll, I'll do this myself. <laughs> So we already spoke about the books you have on your bookshelf. Can yeah. you tell us what these books are? So I've written four books. Um, one of this is Interpretable Machine Learning, which is my first book. Um, and there's also a second edition already. Then this is uh, already finished during my PhD and it's about different, it's basically each chapter has one method that allows you to interpret your machine learning model. And my second book, this was when I started already doing this full time, is Modeling Mindsets. It's a very small book and it's also quite different from the first one. And uh, it's about the different ways to think about uh, modeling your data. Uh, I already mentioned like how I, as a statistician, participated in a Kaggle challenge and quickly realized, okay, it won't get far with the way I approach modeling. 
And so things like these inspired me uh, to write this book. And my third book is quite different. It's about uh, um, a conformal prediction, a method to quantify uncertainty of your models. Um, so it's an introduction to this topic. And this was purely to uh, because I wanted to learn about the topic. And um, so I wrote the book. Uh, it was like an introduction book. So this was a very classic case What's of learning by teaching. The name of the book is Introduction to Conformal Prediction with Python. Confounded? Conformal. Like Conform formal? Like Conformal. Yeah. I don't think I ever heard this term. What does it actually mean? Um, conformal prediction is about uh, the basic idea is that you have some kind of uncertainty in your model. And conformal prediction is kind of a process. So there's many different um, algorithms. And they conformalize this uncertainty measure so that you can kind of trust your output. So for example, you could have a classifier that outputs like class probabilities. And you could use conformal prediction to say um, that instead of outputting like one class or just the probabilities, that you get a set and with some guarantees. So that's the important part, these guarantees of probability that there's like a 95% chance that the correct class is within uh, within these sets. And you mm. can use conformal prediction also to for quantile regression, for example, so that the quantiles really contain 80% of your data or mm -hmm. of your predictions, uh, of the actual um, mm -hmm. um, outcome. So we spoke about this example of churn prediction. So here, uh, instead of just saying that this John Doe will churn with probability 80%, we would have a range, an interval. Yeah, right? that's also How one. Certain we yeah. are that this prediction is actually correct. Yeah, that's also one uh, method in conformal prediction, this uh, uh, kind of um, to for, for predict uh, for classification that you can put uh, like kind of bounds on the probability. That you say, okay, now you don't just give one probability, but a range uh, between which you believe. Um, is it uh, related to, be. to? I guess the, there is some relationship between interpretable AI, this uh, and this topic, right? Because like to come up with these bounds, you kind of need to do similar things, right? Or am I completely wrong? Um. So, like technically. I would say it's different because for conformal prediction, you separate your model. So one similar, let's begin with the similarities. Um, it's very, it's a bit similar to these model agnostic interpretability techniques insofar that you can first train your model, any model really, like it could be a random forest, could be a neural network, and then apply the method afterwards. Because at least for some classes of conformal prediction, which are called inductive conformal prediction, um, these you can apply to your model after you've trained it. And the idea is that you have like a calibration step so you can uh, use some output from a model which quantifies the uncertainty and kind of calibrate it the right way. Um, yeah, but otherwise, uh, yeah, that's the like The, the methods are completely different, right? Only the way you can apply. So there is a model running in production. So you don't need to actually, you know, do anything with that model. You just do something on top. Yeah, it's, it's a, at least one possibility with um, uh -huh. inductive conformal prediction, yeah. Interesting. And the fourth book? Uh, yeah, that's Interpreting Machine Learning Models with Shop. So it uh, has also Python examples, which my first book doesn't have uh, about interpretable machine learning. But otherwise, it's kind of taking one of the chapters from, from interpretable machine learning and doing a deep dive into one of the methods which I think is also the most uh, popular method, SHOP, and also the one of the most versatile methods. So I decided, yeah, would be cool to have a book on it. This was one of the books where I was like, okay, I really have a lot of material already. And I still learned a ton while writing the book because you realize that you still have many gaps. Um, but still, this, this was where I kind of took the stuff I already had and uh, not only learned new things. And how did you decide that uh, you want to write a book about this particular method? Did you do some research that this is the most popular one? Did your readers maybe ask you? 
for more examples or more hands-on like co with code examples or mm -hmm. like what was your process how did you arrive at like you want to write this particular book yeah um for shop i already had some insights that this is hugely popular so it was kind of a market research because i already know from my book uh interoperable machine learning uh like google analytics i know which chapters are popular and shop and this and I also have a separate Chapley Values chapter and they kind of belong together. They are by far the most popular ones. So this was... Um, yeah, most visits, right? Because you can visits, see like yeah. how many yeah. times each chapter was viewed, right? Yeah. And um, also, I think Sharp is not super intuitive. Um, I mean, there's lots of material already, like blog posts and so on. But I thought that um, putting this all together in a book would be valuable to many readers. Um, and then I also like find shop interesting because it's there's always this danger like you shouldn't always only rely on one interpretation method. Um, I also wrote a, like a blog post about it like shop is not all you need, but if someone would force you to use only one, I would use shop um, mm -hmm. because it's very versatile and I think there's a um, lot of value if you learn it. Okay. Well, maybe we need to speak about uh, this particular method. But I see that there are quite interesting questions. And the first question is from Razona. And the question is, is there any difference between explainable AI and interpretable AI? Uh, many, many people ask this. Um, I don't think I have a satisfying answer. Um, I, for some, uh, some days ago, I posted about like an overview, how researchers use this differently. Um, I think, so how I use these terms is, um, I use both interpretable machine learning and explainable AI as keywords. And I think that's most useful because there's so much overlap, so much, but there's, people just use both quite interchangeably. And so if you want to look, like do a Google search on, on some topic, I would always use both. And I, I think I make a distinction with when I use verbs, like uh, when I say, um, I want to explain a prediction. Um, some people would criticize me now, ah, oh, you don't explain a prediction because it's a very strong word, obviously. Um, but I think it's still fair to use it. And if it's, so this would be more for local, like understanding of the model. And for global understanding, I use more the word interpreting. Um, I know that others make the difference to, or distinguish between like interpretable models and they mean with this, like that they are kind of inherently interpretable, like a linear regression model and explainable AI, like for these postdoc things. But I don't think that's a good dis like distinction because the it's not super clear always like the boundaries between the two. So I'm sorry, but I don't think I have a very satisfying, uh, clean so not really much difference. And uh, like, the question was about explainable AI and inter interpretable AI, and you corrected to interpretable machine learning, right? Interpretable. To cover both, yeah. Yeah. Interpretable AI. Is how they usually used, or like this is how the term is. It's it's um, always interpretable ML, not. Ex I'm biased because I'm, I named my book this way, so in my head it's always interpretable ML, and not AI. I, but you can also use this. So I, I guess the question boils down to like definition between interpretable and explainable. Yeah. And yeah, I, I I don't make a big distinction between the two. Well, if you think about the words themselves, like what's the difference between explain and interpret? Yeah. Interpret like you kind of interpret it and you don't necessarily explain it to others. Yeah, <laughs> for me... I understand how it works. Explainable for me is a very strong word. I think that was also like why, like said, interpretable machine learning when I named my book. Um, but I named it quite early on. So a lot of things happened afterwards and the term explainable AI got quite famous as well. And at some point it actually was named explainable AI, my book. Um, but then I decided against it and now it's interpretable machine learning. Um, I think I like interpretability a little bit more because explainability is very strong. Um, because if you can explain something, you have deeply understood it. Mm -hmm. But interpretation is like, okay, you see something and you have an interpretation because you don't like fully understand it, um, but just parts and kind of derive with your like 
insights, which is an interpretation of what you see. So that's why I like the term more. Okay, and uh, now you work as a technical book writer. Yep. You said for a year, right? If you've been doing this. Do you feel lonely when you just write by alone? Do you miss colleagues? Sometimes, yes. Um, I So I like working by myself a lot. Um, um, but sometimes I'm like, I would be nice to like work in a team for a day or so. The problem is you can't do this really on and off. I mean, you can, but then you're like tied to work project. And yeah, I just would like to have this like each other day, like some someday. Um, I mean, it's not fully lonely. I mean, I'm talking to you right now, for example. Mm -hmm. uh, so you can do other things like podcasts and and talk to people. Also, I I'm writing a book at the moment with uh, Timo Freisleben, who's a former colleague of mine, and so we write this book together. It's my first uh, collaborative uh, book. Um, so I also have like a we, we're a little team right now, at least for this one project. So there's mm -hmm. some. It's not only me sitting alone in, in mm -hmm. my room and tinkering and writing i guess writing with somebody else not only makes the process not only makes it like kind of forces you to finish earlier because like half of the content is written by you half of the content is written by your co-author and then you review each other so you kind of mm -hmm. deliver the book faster right um I, mm, I, it's, it's or it's i would say it's slower because my co-author he's has a like a full-time job uh like he's uh -huh. a postdoc so he, he can dedicate as much time as i could so if i would write it alone i might be i think i would be faster um but it's it's fine the way it is um because i think it's uh it's so the topic is supervised machine learning in science it's about how supervised machine learning is is used like for doing research and stuff um so kind of applied machine learning um, and the book has two parts. It's about like justification of why it's okay to do it or whether it's okay to use machine learning um, because there's some problems, of course, with uh, you don't understand, uh, fully understand the model and so on. But also like puzzle pieces that if you use machine learning in science or in research, like what do you actually need to make it work? Because if you just use it like as a Kaggle competition, then there's lots of missing pieces here, like causality, interpretability, uncertainty quantification. So we're kind of putting this together. And I think it's good that we take the time to write this. Um, so we kind of have a half draft now, um, because, but we take, we're take we taking our time to really think this through um, because it's, uh, yeah, I think a bit new topic and uh, also philosophical component to it. Yeah, so that's a, I think it's a fun project. So you said you would write it faster. Because like your co-author has other commitments, mm -hmm. so then you also don't invest as much time as you could potentially. Because like you probably, so what I'm trying to say, you probably have still time, right? So are you working on something else in the meantime? Apart mm -hmm. from so right now I'm participating in a, a challenge, uh, so uh -huh. like not on Kaggle but another platform. Driven data, uh, right? This one yeah. that you mentioned. Yeah, and. Data driven. Yeah, almost full time at the moment, like it's since a week or so. Uh, but yeah, but that's the first time I'm doing this since I'm writing. But I felt like I need I need a hands on project again because sometimes it can feel like this it's like 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 a disconnect if you always write about using machine learning and so on. And I I do have lots of experience from earlier on, but like the last one and a half years, I've only been writing and no doing no data analysis really. And then it feels like a bit out of touch maybe. And so it was really good to do, uh, or it still feels really good to do uh, like a hands-on project with all like the problems with the data and how to model it and so on. Yeah, that's nice that you brought this up because uh, I also, I used to work as a data scientist full time. Now I don't. Uh, and what I'm afraid of is like, I'll lose this touch with reality because if somebody asks me, I don't know about something, something. Then my answer would be based on my experience that I got at work, right? And yeah. I'm no longer working. So this answer might be outdated. And the more I know, 
the longer I don't work as a data scientist, the more outdated the answers my answers become, right? Mm -hmm. How do I stay hands-on? Yeah. This is what you do, right? So you take part in competitions and you make sure that the methods you teach, the things you write about, they're still applicable because you mm-hmm. can try them in these real life projects, right? Yeah. Yeah. But, uh, but I feel like it's, it's, I didn't expect this, but that the writing helps me to be better in a competition. And it's because I'm now much more structured and I actually have like a little logbook and I write about, okay, when I'm stuck, for example, or when I have like a breakthrough and it's kind of, it. I didn't expect this, but it helps me a lot to like keep my thoughts in order because in a machine learning competition, you have so many like directions that you could follow. And very often you try something and it doesn't work. And usually I get very, I, I still get frustrated when it happens, especially if you invest a whole day. But if you can write it down, you can process it, I think, much faster and be like, yeah, this was an experiment. Experiment showed, uh, for example, this weather data didn't help anything with the prediction or improving the performance. So I move on to the next experiment, and to keep, like, to keep myself focused on what I'm doing, it helps me so much. Like that, I'm more um, have this habit of writing. It's this is so quite cool. Unexpected. Like, yeah. I want to learn more, like, how do you exactly structure this? What kind of tools do you use? Like, is it just Google Doc or something? You mean, especially for this competition now or? Yeah, for this competition in general, like, let's say I take part in a competition and they want to follow your approach. I want to have this logbook. How yeah. should I do that? It's extremely messy. So, um, and it's, I'm doing this the first time and it kind of works, uh-huh. but it's not like I have like a fully fleshed out process how I do this. Uh-huh. Uh, so it's not like you finish the competition and you have a book that you can publish, right? Yeah, I actually thought about because there's um, there's a communication, so there's there's prize money uh, involved in this project and in, in this competition, mostly of course if you're like performance based, but there's also like a competition part or like a prize part about explainability and communication. Ah, I see so why it, you take part in that competition. Yeah. The, was a bonus, yeah. And also the topic was interesting to me. So it's about predicting the water flow in rivers. And I like all these ecology uh, data tasks. Um, yeah, so one thought that I have is that I could also use then this journey to kind of write a narrative of how I approach the entire gel- challenge. So I try to write down every day where I work on a challenge, like a few thoughts at least. Is it like um, a diary, uh, diary, how do I say it? Diary. Like, is it like a journal that each time before going to bed, you <laughs> open the right? Dear diary today, this is what I tried. Yeah, it's a bit like this. So I have, I use Obsidian. But it's electronic, right? I assume, not like paper. It's, yeah, it's just very messy. So the, the idea is that it shouldn't be, it, it shouldn't take a lot of effort to do it. So I write very hastily, very just, short sentences and yeah just uh, bullet points and Mm -hmm. i use as a note-taking tool obsidian so also for Mm -hmm. other things and i just have like for this this challenge i have no one file and i just put dump every thoughts in there and also this uh, logbook with what Mm -hmm. i do and yeah but this helps me like keep focused on the project Mm -hmm. and i guess like these bullet points in case you want to go back to them and turn them into a proper text. Yeah, that's one reason. Information there, right? Yeah, one reason is that I just have this because I wouldn't remember like, oh, day seven, Uh I struggle to make a good submission or whatever. And the other reason is because just writing itself, even if I don't ever look at it again, if I don't ever touch it again, it helps me to like to put into words or to summarize what I did the entire day. Because it's super frustrating if you just don't think about what you did all day. Um, but if you write it down like two sentences, okay, today I've met, finished this part and I realized that using weather data doesn't help, then it's mm-hmm. already it helps me to to keep focused on what I do the next day and to not get frustrated that maybe I didn't make as much progress because often you do more than you think. Like mm-hmm. because you tried many things, or at least it's how I feel then. So yeah, because I was going to ask, why would somebody even do that? Like, why would somebody even write it on day seven? I struggled to make a submission. 
because like it's not useful but when you say that you put things in perspective like it's not like on day seven you slacked and didn't do anything yeah you exactly nothing, except yeah. like uh, there were some problems and you need to work on solving these problems and now you know that okay like yeah i actually worked on something yeah and it's sometimes like you're motivated right yeah and uh, it's hard to put into words but sometimes i i um, struggle with something but I don't like formulate in my head what the problem is. And then sometimes I get distracted and go to Twitter or do something else. And but writing down what like what's the essence of my problem, for example, uh, in this particular challenge, the the problem or the, the goal is to predict the volume in a season. So that's the total volume over a few months. But you have to make the predictions at different time points in time. And some points or some dates are actually already within the season. So you have some partial data or some partial water flow already. And I really struggled how to put this into my model, how to like this knowledge, because obviously if you already know that some amount is already through, like has flown through the river, then you can adapt your prediction. And then this was kind of my problem I was thinking about for a few days actually. And, uh, but uh, this helped me to put this into writing, like, hey, this is like what I have to achieve. This is the problem I have to solve, the most important one. Um, yeah. It's uh, almost uh, like psychological, maybe, <laughs> to like, mm -hmm. okay. or, like, to, like a mental process to, to help to mm -hmm. focus. How much time do you spend on this logbook? Oh, very fun? little, very little. Let's maybe, f yeah. So in the beginning, I was just writing down, oh, okay, this is, the so I also have like parts okay to understand evaluation metric I just like put all the information in and things like okay these are the data side like the problems about the data I put have one section so in the beginning I spent a little, maybe a little more but this was like while I was reading the description of the challenge I put in some like I summarized the most important parts for me so there may be I don't know one or two hours and now I just like five or 10 minutes a day. I just, it's very short. I just say a few lines, like what I did today. And yeah. It's like diary, except it's for the competition. Just for the competition, yeah. Okay. Uh, there is a question I really like. And I think we talked about that. The question is, do you have to be an expert in the field to start writing about it? And it helps. <laughs> maybe, or maybe it doesn't, maybe it doesn't. Um, I can see why it's yeah. not always... You, you can make the argument both ways. So if you're not an expert, then you have the same obstacles as your future readers. That means when you write a book, you can like write about these obstacles. So these misunderstandings that you have in the beginning about the technique you're writing about or the, the algorithms you're writing about. Um, but it will also be a very tough process maybe for you because you have to learn and write at the same time. And you also and, need to make sure that what you write about is actually correct, right? Exactly. Yeah, that's it's like you misunderstood something, but you thought like this is the right way, and you write about yeah. this, and then like half a year later, it turns out that it's not, and you have to redo like the whole thing. Yeah, and it's also a question if you already know something. So let's say you would write want to write a book about machine learning, but you don't have like the basics in. So for me, it would uh, going into the machine learning, for example, was for me much easier because I studied statistics. So a lot of the math behind the uh, machine learning and uh, working with data was already, I already knew. So you should also think about like, where, where do you start from? So for example, conformal prediction for me was new, the topic itself, but of course, many of the concepts I already knew, um, even if I didn't know conformal prediction before. So I would say, if the best, the very best thing would be if you're an expert, but you still remember all your struggles and you misunderstandings. Need to go down to the level of the reader, right? Yeah. So for you, it can be like, so for example, cross validation for you is just like you wake up in the middle of the night, your eyes are blindfolded, and you do cross validation, right? Yeah. But for somebody who is new to that, like yeah, they might not even understand like, why it's an yeah. important thing yeah. and how it works and why we need it. Right, and what are the gotchas? So if and you keep like a logbook when learning, <laughs> uh, then you could yeah. also re remember the, your struggles. <laughs> yeah, so I think this would be the ideal setup, being an expert, but still remembering what it was to be a beginner. 
having a beginner who you can experiment with your things. I would say, hey, like I don't understand this thing. You can see where they struggle, right? Mm -hmm. This is, I think, this is what you do with your book too. At least we talked about uh, that for your first book, because you wrote in the open, so everyone could see and comment and say where they don't understand, right? So then you could take this feedback and incorporate it into the book, right? Do you still write in the open? Um, I have so it's quite different between your books, I would say. Uh, so the first book was fully open and I wrote it chapter by chapter and the next book were closed. Um, so like most of the books, I guess. Um, but I did have, so for the, for modeling mindsets, I asked like friends and, and colleagues to, to read uh, individual chapters. And then later on for conformal prediction book and shop book, I actually asked um, readers to be, if they want to be um, test readers and this worked quite well. So because then oh, I already got people from readers. So you, you have you have a newsletter, right? Yeah. So then the newsletter you can write, hey, like I'm writing a book about that. Do you want to be better users or test readers, right? Exactly. And then people say, hey, yes. And then I um, kind of share a um, Google Drive version of the book. And then got, uh, so far this worked really, really well. So I got extremely good feedback from, from through this process. I'm very grateful to everyone who uh, reads my book before they are finished. Um, so this this worked quite well for me. Can it be problematic if you have like too much feedback, like too many people want to yeah. read your books? I once had this problem with the shop book that I invited a lot of um, beta readers. Um, I think one problem is, of course, if, if you have a very problematic part, like then all the readers will comment on this part and then it's like, also kind of a not so good that you give this version to so a lot of people. So I, one lesson for me was to keep the list of readers um, not like uh, small. Um, and so it's, you shouldn't have too many batteries, I think. And rather you should have more phases where you like invite a few readers and incorporate the feedback, have a newer version, have new readers for, for this new version. And that's what worked best for me so far. But of course, it uh, prolongs the process of uh, how long it takes until you can publish. It's also like if you don't agree with the feedback, like what do you do? I, if like, you don't agree, you don't have to use it. I mean, that's that's the nature yeah. of feedback. Uh, but then, like the person might feel offended and uh, okay, like he doesn't want to listen to my feedback. What I'm doing here didn't have this case so far. Um, I think you should always like double check the feedback. Like in the sense of like, maybe I'm wrong. So I should, I always come from this angle, probably I'm wrong because uh, the readers, the reader, so in the end I'm writing for the reader. Um, yeah. But sometimes you can also have the case that this, this I already had that like one reader says, hey, um, you should have this, a simple example in the beginning. And the other reader says, hey, why is that an example already? I d haven't really understood what the method is about so this should be later in, in the chapter. So there's, there can be like uh, different yeah. tastes or different opinions also. And this, you just have to make the decision what you think is best then. And probably like what is what feels more natural to you personally. Yeah. See. Then another question I really like is, do you have any advice for somebody who is looking to start their journey as a technical author? Yeah, don't start with a book. <laughs> um, no, that's yeah, no. Actually, it's what I did. But um, I would say start with small units. So this could be posts. Um, yeah, like a blog post, or maybe even smaller, like on social media, LinkedIn, Twitter, Mastodon, whatever, and start just start writing. Um, obviously, okay. In for posts, you can. Okay, right? That's what... just, just start writing, kind of. <laughs> just do. Um, yeah, because I think the biggest issue is that if you write but never publish, this is frustrating. You don't get feedback, and the worst that it can, I think the worst that can happen is if you publish that nobody will read it. And but that's all. But that's the case if you never publish, then nobody will will read it for sure. Um, because when. Yeah, I mean, you can do writing for yourself, but then it's a more like a diary or something. 
Um, but I think just getting started is the most important. It's, it sounds so like dumb, but yeah, make it small and publish it. Mm -hmm. But maybe also the question is like, uh, how can I be a full-time technical author? Like what are my steps? Mm, yeah, I don't know. I haven't studied many people who do this full-time. Uh, actually, I think most people are just doing this like at the side. Maybe they have a successful career, then they write one book or two at the, on the side. Um, I think the like public like write technical writing is something I, I wouldn't recommend it. Like if you haven't done anything like this before, to to just quit your job and start it. I think that's a bad idea. Uh, because this is something you can actually like build Pretty up much slowly. Anything, right? If you haven't done something, like don't quit your job and start. It. I mean, if you have enough financial security, ah, right. go for it. But the thing is, if you if you have a job until today and tomorrow you say, okay, I, I start technical writing, even if you're good at it and even if you're fast, your first income will come a few months later, many months later, actually, because first you have to write a book, you have to publish it, and even after publishing it, you have to wait like two months before. And even if you make sales on day one, you have to wait two months until you get the money from from. The and sales. how much time it takes to write a book? Oh, that's really difficult to say. Um, I would say at least a few yeah. months. Um, yeah. It can take many years, depending on how much time you spend with the book and how many people are involved. And uh, like, if there's a long like editorial process behind it. Um, for me, I would say like half a year or so mm -hmm. okay uh, but it's half a year of working and then like after that after you publish maybe in a three in maybe in three months you'll start yeah. getting... but also not full-time working because i think you can't work, work full-time on a book that's yeah. i mean i can't write eight hours a day I, you just also, go yeah you could go crazy and yeah so i do a lot of other things like now the challenge obviously um, but also like uh, posting on social media, newsletter writing. And these are things if you want to be self-published and you also need some means of uh, distribution and reaching people. Even if you're not a self-publisher, you often have to do your marketing yourself. Yeah. So like I published a book with Manning. It took two years. And then it feels like, I might be wrong, but it feels like they just want me to do all the marketing. Yes. Why do I need you guys? Right. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, that's something I didn't expect in the beginning. Also, I, I researched this a lot. Uh, it, I, I think it might help if you have a name tag on it, like uh, from a bigger publisher, and then it's in their library, uh, kind of in their in their shop. And because of the stamp of the uh, publisher, it, yeah. I think it can help. Because for me, people just have to trust, like in in me, kind of because. Uh, there was no yeah, this publisher is, saying okay. You do this by already like having audience followers right so yeah. you from the beginning you said you would be writing in the open so people could follow you and could see what you write about but already you already got some trust from them right and then by the yeah. moment you finish the book they thought, thought okay like this is such a cool book and we know Christoph, so we want to buy from him yeah yeah i think this helped immensely because i i mean i didn't have any credibility in the beginning and but i wrote the book in the open so people just could see the book and later on decide whether they want to buy it in paperback form, for example. So there was not, they didn't have like this, there was no big trust issue or anything mm -hmm. uh, because they could just read it beforehand. And what do you use for publishing? Because like you also have physical copies. Yeah. I know that there are websites where you can sell like digital products, PDFs, mm -hmm. videos, whatever. But like you have physical books. Yeah. So yeah, one well, first part is uh, where I sell is on LeanPub, which is the mm -hmm. PDF and eBooks, and this is like just a digital bookstore. Um, then there's print-on-demand services where you basically also upload a PDF file, a cover file, and put on all the details, and then you can self-publish there. So um, the do they also uh, handle the logistics? Not at all. So or they send like you uh, a they send you a truck with books. <laughs> no, they offload it in your yard, and then you do whatever you want with this. No, that's uh, uh, fortunately not the way. I mean, you could do it this way; it would be much more complicated, and I would have to do all the the packaging and sending out books. Yeah, I and I, I guess I would earn more percentage per book. 
Um, but but no, then um, Vodka 5. Yeah. Just so, do this all the time. Yeah, I'm using Amazon KDP, but there are others as well. So that's kind of a print on demand service. So you upload your book there and they sell it for you. And mm -hmm. if you buy a book of mine, then uh, they will just print it and send it to you. So there's mm -hmm. no no pre-printing like or having like a my garage full of books involved. Mm -hmm. So the book, when you do it through Amazon, the book appears in all Amazon stores, right? In the US, in Germany, yeah. like in France. Mm -hmm. oh, that's cool. Yeah, you can actually pick like the marketplaces where you want it to appear. And you can even like uh, pick expanded distribution so it gets to the other bookstores as well, the bigger ones at least, um, like Barnes and Nobles and stuff. Um, oh, okay. Yeah. Like even that. So like even in uh, people can see your books in a bookstore. Yeah. So it's a good time to be a self-publisher because there's lots mm -hmm. of these platforms and tools available. Yeah. So I actually had uh, some doubts uh, whether it's a smart choice because of like JetGPT and stuff uh, when it came out, but I'm more relaxed now. I mean, there's lots of books which are uh, auto-generated by large language models. Yeah. But I, I still say that's a good time to be a writer. Interesting. So you said uh, that people can find your books on LeanPub and Amazon, but do you have like a homepage with all the books and links and all that? Uh, yeah, my ChristophMoyner.com, uh, uh, ChristophMoyner.com uh, slash books. It's just a list of my books. Yeah. And probably it's a good idea to follow you on LinkedIn and Twitter, right? Yeah, it's always a good idea, of course. <laughs> Anything else you wanted to mention, but we forgot to talk about? Um, no, just uh, I had a lot of uh, fun talking with you. I think it was a very nice uh, conversation. Yeah. Yeah, thanks. Yeah, indeed, it was nice. Uh, yeah, it's unfortunately all, all we have time. This is all the time we have for today. It was uh, and, very quick. Yeah. <laughs> that was quick, even though it was actually one hour. Yeah, felt yeah shorter. it felt like very short. Yeah, so thanks for joining us today. And thanks also everyone for joining us today for asking questions and yeah, well, have a great week ahead and uh, see you, you too. in a week. Yeah.